Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. In this episode, we speak to Peterson Silva about the concept of freedom in anarchist political theory and its relevance for contemporary politics. Don't forget to click subscribe, like and share this video. The academia has discussed uh, freedom a lot recently, right? So we have talked about liberalism, republicanism, right? There's been a resurgence in republicanism, but uh, anarchists have been left out of this conversation of freedom. And part of the reason is because there, there might not be exactly a clear concept of what freedom is in the anarchist tradition of thought. I think that anarchism is very diverse in terms of dealing with freedom, especially because I think it attracts a lot of people with different uh, philosophical assumptions, different, different philosophical backgrounds. So if you think about it, like for instance Bakunin, right, coming from the Hegelian tradition, and if you get, and, and the way he talks about theology and, and Christianity or religion, I don't know, like things like that. And then you got Leon Tolstoy coming from a point of view of Christianity. And then you got uh, Proudhon coming from a completely different tradition. Then you get, you know, it's, it's really very different background assumptions that change the way you talk about freedom and, and propose to understand it. And uh, the idea is try to read into that and uh, come up with a concept that is more like a commonality and try to, to define the concept better so that we can insert ourselves as anarchists in that academic discussion on the concept of freedom. We are afraid, we are brave. These hearts, they do beat. One of the problems is, well, if I'm talking about the anarchist concept of freedom, who are the anarchists, right? What are the texts that I should read? And then we come in contact with some of the problems of subcurrents and, and strands and branches of anarchism and which ones are really anarchists, which ones are not, and, and all these kinds of internal discussions that are really relevant, right, when you're talking about the anarchist tradition as a whole. To, for this research, it's relevant to realize that it's it's more than than just saying who is anarchist and who is not, but who has contributed to anarchist discourse, who has contributed to anarchist tradition. So if you get, for instance, the Zapatistas in, in Mexico, right, in Chiapas, they have certainly contributed to anarchist discourse. They have certainly been... It's, it's kind of a political experience that anarchists have... Uh, looked to approvingly. So there's a contribution there, even though it could be complicated to speak uh, about them in terms of, look, they're anarchists, right? They might not be, but at the same time, there's something there. So I think thinking about things in terms of contributions kind of sidesteps the whole discussion about who is an anarchist. And so to, to understand that uh, kind of gives us a, a, a good idea of where the tradition is, the, the, the debates, internal debates that even shaped the tradition. So I, I've tried to cast a wide net in terms of experiences, in terms of um, subcurrents, branches, strands, to really try and see what's common among them and, all, and also what's different. Anarchists are rarely analytical in their texts and, and pamphlets and, and philosophical discussions. So they don't usually, at the beginning of a text, come on and say, well, you know, uh, readers, forget what you think you might know about freedom. You're wrong. I'm going to explain to you what freedom really is, like conceptually, and then I'm going to use that concept coherently. Uh, anarchists don't usually do that, right? Anarchists are usually commonsensical, right? They use common sense words and concepts and try to draw people into the discussion, right? Be a little open to being read more widely. And so when they do that, they end up um, kind of bending to using the liberal common sense way of understanding freedom, right? And that presents some challenges because later when uh, people in academia, for instance, read anarchists, they read that and say, well, there's no specific concept of freedom here. You know, it's just... Uh, it's just liberalism, some sort of liberalism. So that's, that's a problem. So in order to get to an anarchist concept of freedom, we have to kind of do some uh, reverse engineering in a way. So we have to, to think like, well, if anarchist political positions are so different from everything else, it, it cannot be that the notion of freedom is the same. So we have to, to think about these differences and what makes anarchists different from liberals and Marxists and Republicans and so on. And uh, how does that relate to a more fundamental concept of freedom? Arms, they do break. Break, break, break. 
really you have to change the way you see the notion of individual itself, right? It has to change to, to accommodate for anarchist freedom because th this whole divide between individual and society is kind of a, is, is an integral part of mainstream Western political theory. And that's why I think anarchists are so distinctive, right? So sometimes that's very obvious, for instance, in, in Bakunin's uh, work in terms of trying to say, well, you know, the individual is, is nothing without society and things like that. But I think it's, it's, it's more complex than that. I think we have to try and get also uh, the decolonial production uh, related to anarchism and how that affects this relationship between individual society. I think that we come to realize that they are both uh, two sides of the same coin of a, a socializing process, right? A process of social relations. And I think that's, that's something that's really important with, with anarchism. We're always focusing on social relations. And when you see freedom as a characteristic of a relationship instead of the individual, right? Things change quite quickly. If you go like to Bakunin, right? His famous, maybe the most famous formulation on anarchist freedom is his, right? And it says that uh, you have to have equality as well, unless um, all my, you know, everyone, unless every every man and, and woman has uh, freedom. Uh, if they don't have it, I don't either, this sort of thing. So equality is everywhere in, in anarchist discourse. And um, Ruth Kina's research in particular, she has supervised my work, uh, has made me see how much the language of domination is also important. It, it featured more prominently in the more in the earlier texts of anarchism, but it's it's interesting because it frames this urge for equality in a in in a nicer way. Because the thing about this discourse of equality, you know, demanding equality as an integral part of what it means to be free, is kind of hard because equality of what, right? What are you trying to equalize? And would you get to a point where everyone will be equal and then that will be it, right? So that is a classical thing, even in, in liberal discussions and everything like that. It's kind of a liberal trap in a way, right? If you see, both if you see freedom from an individual standpoint and if you see it as something that is detachable from equality, things like that, it's kind of a trap. If, if you think in those terms, it's, it's kind of hard. And another thing, for instance, with a recent Graeber, David Graeber research on, uh, on the idea of freedom and equality, he, he tells us how the indigenous critique of European societies, for instance, was always initially the critique of freedom, right? So they didn't initially think, oh, guys, you are so unequal, right? They said, well, you don't have freedom. And then later they came to understand that inequality of material resources kind of gave way to inequality of power among people, right? And, and then the discourse of inequality caught on, even within Europe, of course, Rousseau and things like that. So it's interesting how, you know, it, it, equality matters, but it, it can't be reduced to this thing about this, this liberal redistribution thing, right? That once we're equal, it'll all be fine. It is not really about equality. It's about domination. It's about uh, distribution of power in a sense, right? So it's, it's not really that people have more than others, but how this can be used so that the voices, you know, some people go unheard and things like that. So I think that freedom is really tied to this notion of uh, fighting against domination in that sense. So apart from the idea of uh, figuring out the idea of equality, right? How frequent it is and, and what could it mean and how it's related to domination, right? And also the whole thing about the individual, right, which I think is a very Eurocentric legacy of anarchism that kind of hinders our way of, of looking at the whole social process and how we could privilege that in our thinking. One of the things that is, is more um, problematic is the whole idea of non-restriction, I think, as a concept of freedom which is because it's, it's the common sense, right? If you're, if you're bound physically even, right? That's the, the metaphor we use to feel free, right? It, it, I mean, feel unfree, right? So we tend to think about being free as being not restricted by something. And that's really a conceptual straitjacket. I mean, anarchists talk like that. They use the word like that and then they question it, right? And they say, well, you know, uh, 
we, we want to be free, but are you really within the state? Are you really within capitalism? To think in terms of uh, non-conformity, it shifts your view quite dramatically because you are assuming there is a, 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 a norm, right? There is a, a rule in a sense, and there will always be. As people interact com in complex ways, there will always be like social expectations and social patterns, right? A rule will always be there. There will always be a norm, right? And, and so, but the thing is to not be able to, to conform to that and to do that in a way that doesn't create or, or enforce domination. That, that's what freedom really means and that really changes how you see everything else. Thankful for the sun. I think that presenting uh, freedom this way, sort of like latitude for non-conformity, uh, which is also non-dominating latitude for non-conformity, that's an important qualification there. I think it's, it's important in practice because, you know, as I said, like it's kind of a reverse engineering. So we, we begin with the anarchist positions and, and, and think that, that that's what freedom must mean if you're thinking about these institutions. So if you think about uh, the commune and how to deal with uh, property or how not to have private property of the means of production and things like that, and uh, how to deal with, uh, you know, decision making processes and things like that. It's all to ensure that we have like these safeguards against domination in a way so that we are uh, alert and vigilant to not, to not let all sorts of inequalities uh, flourish and then when we least realize then we are in a situation that is harder for things to change, right? So it's, it's kind of always being open to, to non-conforming, always understanding that things are in a way now but they can change and circumstances can change and so you have to be able to change your social relations and i think for instance uh not to be too cliche i mean this is an interview in times of you know a, a pandemic uh phenomenon so we kind of have to talk about it but you know it's a uh, it's it's really a, a nice example of what that means in practice why are we not free is it because the pandemic is uh, imposing things on us in a way yes but the problem when we point out that capitalism is a real problem with the pandemic is that it has made things harder to change in a way that it, it, could, it would be required to now, right? Things have changed. The situation has changed so dramatically that we should be able to better organize the way we, we work, the way we live in order to, you know, uh, protect the people who are more vulnerable and so that everyone can be more protected in fact, right? And so that we can uh, uh, fight this together and things like that. But the way the society is structured in, 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 in this, I'm talking not only about the state and capitalism, but patriarchy and, and race relations and things like that, it, it makes it very hard for us to stop and think and, and, and rethink and, and reshape our social relations based on changing circumstances, for instance. Apart from, you know, uh, the institutional uh, arrangements that we know are very associated with anarchism, I think it's interesting that thinking about freedom in, these, in, in this way, it's, uh, it's not really a matter of becoming free, like you're either free or you're not, but you're expanding freedom, right, in, uh, in, and also in several levels, in several social networks. So you can be very free in a certain social network, in a certain uh, web of relations with some people, but when you expand your view and, and consider other relations, then you're not as much. So you have to fight for freedom on that level. So I think that there's a lot of, um, depending on what networks you're talking about, or social networks, you can have different um, experiences and different uh, attempts to to become more free because it's always a matter of context as well right so in a in a the, the way you become more free in a romantic relationship is very different from the uh, becoming free in the the place you live which is different from becoming free in the place you work right so it's interesting to think about the diversity of anarchism that way because you know, we have some discussions about, for instance, what is the appropriate place, you know, for anarchists. Like, Bookshing has all this talk about cities, right? Oh, you have to have the decision has to be, there has to be like assembly, city-based assembly or something like that, right? While for 
I don't know, since Prudhomme, we've been talking about the, the worker association, right, as the basic unit of the federation and things like that. But I think that we have to, we must do something like what we're seeing, for instance, in Rojava, right, where you have like intersecting multiple levels of communities that they have all like different attributes and, and they deal with sometimes with the same thing. So they have to talk. So it's a very interesting way of not privileging one sector of activity, one way of relating, but thinking that you're going to have to apply the same principle of freedom uh, with whomever you relate in, in however way. So there are lots of ways, lots of practices that this can give birth to. When we talk about, for instance, the recent uprisings uh, about the death of uh, George Floyd, right, in the United States, I think that is interesting because some voices here and there are saying that the United States has failed uh, black communities, has failed black people. And uh, I think that anarchists support that kind of thinking, but they go beyond it. And I think the uprisings, they are happening precisely because... Uh, you know, black people, not only in the United States, but in, in several other places, they, they look at the current system and they, they see that the problem is systemic and that they can't do anything to, to change the, the violence that they suffer and the way that they live through it. So I think that anarchists, um, the idea of insurgence and the, the revolution as a horizon and things like that, they speak, uh, they, they speak so well in these times because it's all about seeing that to non-conform, you know, you really require the destruction of these sort of repressive institutions. And uh, in Brazil, for instance, what's happening is interesting because we have uh, a certain portion of, you know, the, the president's, uh, the, the current president's supporters who are, you know, doing all sorts of public uh, gatherings to, you know, ask for a dictatorship, basically, right, so to military intervention and things like that. And there has been a lot of support for fighting back against that. And the concept of freedom, as I've been thinking about it, also, uh, you know, is, is in that, in the sense that anarchists can support an opposition to that, because even though uh, a lot of movements in Brazil have merely claimed to support, you know, democracy and the institutions, you know, that, that are not what the president wants right now, um, we still support that in the same sense that Kropotkin said once, you know, that, well, you know, we recognize the difference between a dictatorship and bourgeoisie uh, and bourgeois democracy, right? Even though bourgeois democracy is not really the best thing and is not really desirable for us, what, what we really want out of uh, our social organization is it's still interesting to defend it um, in given contexts because it's it offers more freedom because it offers more latitude for nonconformity than a dictatorship of course he didn't say latitude for nonconformity i'm just saying that it jives with that right it, it matches that that defense right this language matches that defense of the of some political actions so you know everywhere anarchists are acting in terms in different circumstances to try and broaden our capacity to change the way we live Right, and I think that's that's really what it's about in terms of freedom. We will not forget nor abandon ourselves in the face of riot gear, fortified condos, and the ambitions of the rich. Those who would rather be assets than members of a people. We do press on and are born every morning thankful for the sun.